none other than Dr. Vivek Kadambi. Uh, Dr. Vivek Kadambi. He is the medical director at Balasante Institute of Functional Medicine and Wellbeing. He is an ophthalmologist with more than 30 years of experience, a musician, a singer, a golfer, educative speaker, and BHRT guru in a true sense. His venture to introduce BHRT therapies in India with the help of his brother, Dr. Ashok Kadambi, who is a successful DM endocrin endocrinologist in the US, has been commendable and a life-changing experience for people pan-India, especially women suffering from thyroid disorders, reproductive issues, postmenopausal symptoms. He is a pioneer in compounding thyroid hormones and providing the best quality of bioidentical progesterone, testosterone, estrogens to his patients. Let us educate ourselves from the legend himself. His topic for today, his favorite topic, as uh, he's our mentor as well as we are juniors to him. Uh, his topic is uh, T3 and infertility today. So let us hear from uh, the legend himself. Thank you so much, sir. And please go ahead with your... All right. <laughs> right. Am I audible, everybody? Yes, am yes. I audible? Very yes, good. Yes, yes. So it's, all, it's wonderful to be... Uh, to be introduced by someone that uses the word legend at least three times in the introduction. <laughs> I feel already that it's time for me to retire. But anyway, uh, thank you, Karishma. And uh, particularly, thank you, Anurag. I thought we were, uh, we were lagging behind in the run rate. And you hit a few fours and sixes and managed to bring us back on time. And we started tying on for, at, uh, uh, though, though Karishma was trying to be a nice empire, uh, it, uh, her, her efforts were in vain. But we have caught up with time. Uh, I can see that my favorite front benches of my uh, my students, Karishma, Arzu, both of you are over here. Wonderful. Dr. Musa, thank you for being here. Uh, Mahesh, of course, uh, Jairam, he, he's, uh, you know, he's really been my, uh, my guru, actually, in many ways. So I would, uh, I would uh, like, I would love, love to, you know, have his comments at the end of the session. Dr. Praveen, I thought he came and he went. And of course, uh, Dr. Preeti, that required, you know, this one thing, one, uh, this is second, second year running, and it requires a lot of guts to do that. And obviously, uh, you know, the gut cannot be leaky. So on that note, you know, I wish I had a live audience because usually I get a few laughs when I say that. Anyway, coming back, coming to the topic, can I start sharing my uh, my topic over here, my uh, my presentation? Yes. May I? All yes. right. So yes. here we go. Here we go. Uh, there we go. Share, and I I hope I don't have to go out and come in again. Because I yes, you're able I, to share. Yes. Okay, let me start my presentation. Uh, with a lot of fanfare. First of all, I want to close all these tiny things which are here. So, yeah, I don't want to see anybody. So, Karishma, just tell me if something is going wrong. Yes, yes. With my Can action. Yeah, I think this light show. All right. So, yeah. that's it. Uh, so, T3 and infertility. My wife just asked me, you know, how's your, uh, you, what's your topic for your, uh, uh, you know, for your webinar? I said T3 and infertility. Oh, you're, that is your boss. You're the boss. I said, I'm very comfortable with this. But my question is, how do I actually, what do I do different today uh, to make this impact? So I, I think that firstly, I'm so glad that Dr. Preeti didn't ask me to speak on something like thyroid and infertility. And specifically, she chose T3. Now, it's very important for those who are not uh, aware of this to understand the big difference between T3 and thyroids when we refer to them as general. Most of the time when you refer to thyroids or the treatment of thyroids, we are always talking about T4. And it's very important to understand the difference is not only in, in the number, not only in the molecule, but it's entirely different in terms of its, its molecular structure, its pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and the impact it has on the body. And of course, the T3, T3, T3 therapy is a completely different world than uh, the standard treatment with uh, T4 which is uh, you know, using drugs like L-troxin or, or thyronome. In fact, it's more, it's more harmful to use uh, T4, which I hope I should bring out in the first few slides, than to use uh, T3. So having said that, I think everybody knows that the, there are two types of uh, thyroid produced by the body, T3 and T4. Uh, T3 is about 10 times more potent, some say four times, some say five times, but it's definitely more potent than T4. And we may consider T4 as a precursor or, or a low potency version of the T3. And uh, it's important to know that the thyroxine that we use, the levothyroxine, is nothing but the T4. Why this is important is that uh, we need to understand that when you look at recommendation by endocrine society, thyroid society, their recommendations over the years have not changed very, very well. The recommendation always is 
that only in those cases where the standard treatment of using you know, T4 or levothyroxine, only in those cases where it does not work, should you use a combination of T3 and T4 or you should introduce T3 into the treatment? Now, this is very interesting. That means you accept the fact that there is something better than T4, that only if something doesn't work, you want, you want to introduce something that you believe will work or work better. So my question to most people here is that, you know, when, when you choose anything, uh, you know, your car, your food, or what you eat, would you first say that, no, no, let me first take, take something which is not so good. Let me take the cheaper and the lousier one. And if that doesn't work, then let me try something which is good. So the entire philosophy of saying that T3 and T4 should be, or T3 should be reserved for only those cases where the uh, T4 does not work. I think that entire thinking and philosophy is wrong. And I hope I get this across. Now, basics, fundamentals are very important to understand. If you understand the fundamentals, then the rest of it becomes very easy. And do not try to uh, follow any type of treatment where the scientific foundation is not strong. Scientific foundation has to be very, very solid before you recommend, especially when you're doing something which is different. Whenever you do something different, you better be on very solid ground. Uh, why? Because there are enough people to, uh, to actually take a shot at you as you're trying to climb a slippery slope. So basic, very uh, basics. Thyroid produces T4 and D3. Uh, if, if in a normal healthy individual, 80% of what is produced is T4, 20% is T3. Then in the peripheral periphery, there are enzymes, the D1, uh, D2, that will convert the T4 into uh, the T3. And then, of course, the T3 uh, goes into action. It's very important to realize over here that T4 has an extremely long half-life. So those of you who attend my lectures will, will know I keep saying this again and again, that it is a half-life that makes all the difference. T4 half-life is almost a week, so it really doesn't make any difference. It's like an elephant that moves very slowly and just goes along. T3 is very active. Half-life is less than a day. And therefore, its action is quick. It's also metabolized very quickly, which makes it very, uh, very potent, very active, but also makes it a lot safe because it gets washed out very quickly. So if you want to increase your T3 or in increase this conversion, there are some ways to do it. Some is iodine, vitamin A, B12, B6, you name it. So whenever we talk about anything that improves, say, gut health or improves health in general, it will also improve the T3 uh, levels in the body and in the tissue. And this, of course, can, uh, happens in certain tissues uh, much more than others, particularly when you talk about the brain, liver, kidneys, muscles, and, of course, the gonads. Now, there are some things that will not allow this to happen very well. And instead of converting into uh, T3, the T4 goes into something called reverse T3. Now, I won't go into the fundamentals of reverse T3, except that it's a mirror image of T3. And it's, it just goes and it blocks the receptors. It has no action. Uh, it will just sit there doing nothing. In fact, it will compete with the T3. So the more of T4 you have, the more, uh, more can converts to our reverse T3. And the less effect you see. This, this is very seen very clearly clinically. Because as you keep increasing the dose of T4, Karishma, I'm here or am I talking to myself? Are you? No, am I, are you? Uh, good, good. Because okay. I'm, I'm just looking at my screen. I'm not sure. Yes, Sometimes yes. it yes. happens. All right. So reverse T3, just take a look at some of the factors and you will understand why it's so important to actually assume that a, that a large part of T4 is really getting converted to reverse T3. For example, T4 medication itself or exogenous T4, it's different from endogenous T4, it itself causes more conversion to reverse T3. So there again, you're actually starting on a wrong wicket, on a very bad wicket. That the T4 that you're taking itself is causing the uh, uh, conversion to reverse T3. Cortisol level, stress, so that's another thing that comes in the way. Vitamin D deficiency, anti, uh, antibodies, especially anti-TPO. This will keep coming again and again because as much as 80% of of the uh, population, or at least 80% of women that suffer from hypothyroidism are uh, antibody positive or don't have, uh, have Hashimoto's disease. Ferritin deficiencies and estrogen dominance. All these factors are so common. I'm just, this is a very uh, noisy slide, but don't get uh, distracted by that. What I'm trying to point out is that the conversion of T4 to T3 depends upon a lot of factors. And some factors, you're already, again, starting on a weak wicket. Exogenous does not get converted very well. There's a D2 enzyme defect in most most of the population say on an average 25 percent one in every four they have this enzyme defect and therefore they're not converting adequately into the t3 there's some uh, phenomenon known as ubiquitination i think uh, that's a very interesting phenomena i won't waste time explaining that but uh, thanks to that phenomenon t4 doesn't get converted adequately t3 and then as you age or uh, go towards perimenopause menopause low progesterone low testosterone low hgh 
all these factors, kidney, liver diseases, nutritional deficiencies, chemotherapy, alcohol, smoking. So you name the factor and if you look at this, most people look at it and say, look, I think I have at least three, four of these or five of these or six of these. So in other words, it's difficult to find an individual that does not have those factors that inhibit conversion of T4 to T3. So it, it would really mean that a large section of the population, healthy population also, do not convert the T4 to T3 adequately. And therefore, we must actually master or learn how to use the, how to use T3 in the treatment. Now, not everybody uh, should accept what I do. They just have to make sure that clinically, they, they should look at the cases. They, and for those who are suffering from hypothyroidism themselves, it's very common the disease. They should also see how, how they feel when they take the T3. So rather than using the word, uh, uh, rather than using the term uh, uh, hypothyroidism, I like to use the word low T3 syndrome, just as we use a low T syndrome for, uh, for uh, what used to be called as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism or uh, the testosterone or ADAM as what is known today. So low T, what happens in low T is TSH is normal, the T4 is normal, and the T3 is low or low, no normal, but the symptoms are quite severe. Symptoms are, all the symptoms are there. And therefore, uh, I would say that this is where we talk about low T syndrome. And uh, when I say hypothyroidism, I usually mean most of them are in the normal range of TSA. So they would not be called hypothyroidism by the normal sense, but most of, most of us in functional medicine would call them as hypothyroid or low T, a low T3, sorry. Now, there are three enzymes that you should know about. It's just very simple, D1, D2, D3. Uh, d iodine is 1 to 3. Uh, D1 is the one that converts in the periphery T4 to T3 in the bloodstream and uh, D2 in the uh, tissues and in the periphery. And D3, which is very interesting, D3 not only converts T4 into inactive or reverse T3, it also converts T3 into the inactive form or weak form of T2. Now, this is to be borne in mind because that is where essence all the uh, therapy comes. So when I talk about anything that I refer to in the future about thyroids and infertility, thyroids and its management of infertility, I'm specifically talking about the T3 therapy. And uh, but towards the end, uh, by, the, by the time I finish my presentation, I'm sure you'll understand the importance of T3 over T4 or conventional treatment. Everybody knows that thyroids are required for metabolism, thyroids are required for uh, mental development, good cognitive function. Thyroids are required definitely for ovulation. Thyroids are required. But thyroid, thyroid, we got so used to using the word thyroid that we forget that the one who's really working very hard is the T3. So always start the menstrual cycle and look how complex it is. But it's something that you should always keep in mind. Look, you should be very clear uh, how the uh, hormones move in your body because many different uh, publications will give you different uh, ways in which these uh, changes happen. But FSH, you have that one hump of the FSH and then a peak LH surge causing ovulation. And then important to understand that progesterones only come in the second half of the cycle. Okay, that is the most important part. Now the question is, and the estradiol, of course, estrogen also has uh, two waves. Now the question over here is, let's not talk about other hormones. Let's say what happens when the T3 is low or suboptimal or low T3. One is that you will you will see, and these are these are just I'm just generalization, not necessarily in that order. There is anovulation or subovulation. Uh, therefore, obviously, uh, there is no, there will no there will be no production of progesterone. Just remember this: when there's ovulation, there's a production of progesterone. When there's no ovulation, the progesterone production is zero, or it will just show up in the blood as 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.03. So then the luteal phase gets shortened. Menses may, of course, can get become irregular. There's insulin resistance, and I talk about PCOS. The reason I club insulin resistance and PCOS together and not PCOS and irregular menses is because, really speaking, PCOS is a metabolic disorder. It's, it's a disorder that's basically the underlying cause is metabolic, metabolic imbalances of insulin, imbalance of insulin resistance, imbalance of thyroids, vitamin D, and as a result of which ovulation gets affected, as a result of which you have these clinical symptoms of PCOS. So managing PCOS, which is also partly uh, comes under man managing of infertility, also comes in the domain of T3. Estrogen dominance also is caused. Why? Because if there is suboptimal low T3, ovulation is suboptimal, and therefore progesterone are not adequately made, or every cycle doesn't produce progesterone, you get estrogen dominance. And we all know what estrogen dominance lead to. This is not the topic of uh, my presentation today, so I won't talk about that. So now there is uh, T3 and the fem female. Let's talk about female fertility before we even also include the male fer uh, fertility aspects of T3. FSH and T3 stimulations are there in, in, the, in, the, in the cell, and that cell is the granulosa cell. Regulation of aromatase, 
in the uh, in the ovaries follicular development and there are t3 t uh, ts receptors on the mature and developing oocytes now all this should tell you how important the t3 is and the tsh also is as far as the developing of the egg is concerned i just want to pop in some every time we come across something new and this was something in, uh, published in 2018 something called as gnih uh, which is really the gonadotropin inhibitory hormone and uh, if you just look at this diagram uh, this figure over here don't get confused with all these uh, uh, you know with a lot of this uh, letters that come on this figure but important to know is that thyroid hormone or in this case t3 it inhibits this inhibiting hormone and therefore it then allows the gnrh L lsfsh and gonadotropin hormones to function very well and when there is a stress and when there is glucocorticoids or steroids they will stimulate this inhibiting hormone so the mechanisms we are discovering more and more but we always knew that when there was suboptimal thyroid or t3 the gonadotropin hormones also did not do too well now as time goes by more and more discoveries on how that happened you know takes place but we always see that there is a hpa axis there are three axes that works almost uh, parallel to each other the hpa axis the spg axis a uh, gonad uh, there is a uh, um, hypothalamus pituitary and the gonads and the hpt axis the hypothalamus pituitary and thyroid so this is important to understand how these hormones talk to each other and they work together with each other but it, even when we did not have this knowledge we knew one thing that we don't have enough t3 t3 is suboptimal or you have anything that's blocking t3 or or, or all these actions you find that even the gonadal hormones ultimately are suboptimal or they suffer that was known we are only are discovering more and more about mechanisms of how it's done the other thing is that thyroids affect every aspect of fertility one is of course the formation of the egg the ovulation it also uh, is important is it in promotion of follicular genesis and ovulation cell growth survival of the fertilized egg then the movement of the fertilized egg down the fallopian tube optimizing endometrium for this implantation so everything that you want to do uh, as ivf whatever you want to have optimally in ia ivf the thyroids are supposed to be doing so in other words that if you were to uh, if you were to even uh, optimize the t3 in cases of ivf you would probably get better results than those cases where you do ivf without optimizing the t3 it's so quite logical and obvious because what you want to duplicate in ivf that is promote follicular genesis better ovulation cells harvest them uh, you know uh, of course in this case you you don't allow the mood you implant them or you you allow or you allow optimal create the endometrium so that there is optimum opt optimal uh, implantation can take place so we'll come to the part about the placenta hcg uh, later right now is enough to say that every aspect of ovulation and fertilization successful fertilization is is well controlled and even determined by the uh, optimize optimal levels and i'm constantly using optimal and not normal because this is important for almost everybody to understand that normal never means optimal normal means normal and normal means a large section of population that are not healthy so here we go uh, before i come to placenta i will say that we have now seen that fertilization how what role it plays i just like to pick up i like to read journals and just pick up important sentences from there for example this sentence uh, is very important there's a specific uh, studies and there are many studies done on t3 thank god now we have we can actually see so many studies thanks to google internet we can you know set up home and pick them out influence of t3 on secretion of steroids and thyroid hormone receptor expression in chicken ovarian follicles so again this is what i like it's not influence of thyroid hormones influence of t3 so i'm just quoting from the thyroid hormones acting via nuclear receptors are involved in regulation of the pituitary ovarian axis and processes associated with follicular growth and maturation follicular growth follicular maturation obviously fertility uh, uh, will be positively impacted another interesting topic i won't waste much time because this is a uh, separate for a separate lecture itself a journal club discussion cross talk between reproductive reproductive how they speak to each other Here, i'll just quote something from there with uh, talks about thyroid hormones are vital for female reproductive system homeostasis this cross talk may be one of the pivotal factors regulating female productive behavior and hormone related disease including tumors so whenever people ask me you know where is the evidence where is the evidence i show them their own, this is all the journals so i i love using the phrase terai tota kehta hai terai tota ke your, your journals are telling me that i that t3 has a role to play in this thyroid hormones have a role to play in this now question is uh how do you how do you interpret this and how do you use this and apply them uh, apply this to the clinical knowledge so we've talked about female infertility i've summarized that quite well i want to leave some things for questions in the end 
Let's quickly come to the male part of it. Suboptimal or low T3, what does it cause? Reduce uh, sperm volume, decreased motility, sperm defects, lower libido, erectile issues, lower testosterone, LH and FSH. Now, why would you not give or not optimize T3 in a couple and even in the male of someone that comes and is, is struggling to conceive? They want to start the family, they're struggling to conceive. And you're talking about all other methods, including how to stimulate uh, uh, ovulation, how to uh, do an IVF, IUI, whatever it may be. But uh, you are not looking at very simple optimization, not just thyroid, I would say uh, the other factors which uh, also come into play. But still, you have to do something that will improve the sperm maturation, sperm count, motility. Ladies' cells, it has an impact. When you talk about uh, the effect of the TSH directly on germinal cells and Sertoli cells, indirect effects of T3. So you see, uh, there's always, when it comes to T3, the T4 doesn't have any action on ladies' cells, but it is a T3 that you see this dotted line that goes along with the FSH and also influences this. So this is again important to understand that all at when you when you talk about T3 effect, it's at all levels. When you talk about T4 effects, T4 depends upon its conversion to T3. T, T4 is is the person at the non-striker end, sitting on the non-striker end and wants T3 to hit all the sixes and all that and do the job and then wave to the crowd and and, and take all the all the credit. So remember, the T4 is a non-striker. It is sitting there. You need the T4. I'm not saying you don't need it, but there's enough T4 in the body uh, to, to manage. But if you might want to focus on the T3. Uh, again, we are talking about uh, the hormone crosstalk. It's quite complex, but if you look at this picture, you can see that from T3 is a direct action on the testes, uh, direct action on insulin, indirect leptin, cortisol, mel melatonin. They keep talking to each other. So whenever we say we want to optimize uh, the th thyroid or any hormone, it necessarily means you have to work with all the hormones together. But thyroid, if, if the whole body is uh, you know, endocrine incorporated or hormones incorporated, thyroid is the CEO. Thyroid is the one that, that makes sure that everything runs very well, the controlling hormone. Okay, pregnancy. Now, you can't talk about infertility and not talk about pregnancy. Now, let's, let's take a few of the important facts relating to pregnancy. Now, the goal of, of pregnancy is, of course, that first that, uh, that in the first trimester, it should be a viable fetus, viable. And this, uh, we've talked about ovulation. And the second part, the, uh, it should uh, go to term. And, and healthy, uh, healthy uh, uh, baby should be delivered at the practically full term. So there is the most important hormone, progesterone. But again, this talk not being progesterone, it's important to realize that the progesterones and the thyroids, they work uh, hand in hand. If you do not have adequate T3, the progesterone output that one would expect from the placenta would not be adequate to sustain that pregnancy and you would have trouble. The fetal thyroid does not begin to concentrate iodine till 10 to 12 weeks of gestation. Synthesis and secretion of thyroid hormone controlled by fetal pituitary TSH ensues approximately 20 weeks of gestation. During early pregnancy, the fetus is reliant on maternal thyroxine. So this is important that when you are handling, in pregnancy, you have to focus on handling the maternal thyroxine. Let the, the, the placenta dis, uh, take care of the uh, rest of it. Now, at birth, approximately 30% of T4 in the cord blood origins from the mother. Okay, now comes some interesting features that you have to understand. And Dr. Mahesh, I know, is one, one person that uh, is a lot of attention to this. The serum TBG levels going up. So your interpretation of TSH suddenly changes during pregnancy or when you're using T3. So do not follow the same standard interpretation of TSH or F, of T4 or T3. This is a little bit of a difference. But if you understand that there's a rise in thyroblandin globulin. So they, more of them is bound. So actually you need more T3. You need more, whatever you're doing, you need more of what you're doing. Let's say 30%, 50% more, but you need more. It's not enough to continue the same dose through pregnancy. Increased degradation of T4 and T3 by the uh, uh, D3 or d is 3, which is abundant in the placenta, chorion, amniotic, mem, uh, and the amnion. Therefore, again, you, this is a good protective mechanism. Don't be afraid of, uh, of increasing the dose, thinking, oh, if I increase the dose, maybe it'll go through placenta and start uh, cause hyperthyroidism in the fetus. But that doesn't happen because you actually need much more because the, that is a nature's protection that it's created a barrier. But that barrier is, is okay when a person has good amount of thyroids. When a person already is in borderline or hypothyroidic state or low T3 state, uh, then uh, this does not work to our advantage and probably the mental development, the neurological development of the fetus is going to suffer. Now, very difficult to prove or disprove this, but you know, try and use scientific data and, 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 and scientific knowledge and put some logic together. High volume of T4 distribution, there's an increased plasma volume. So your blood tests are going to be misleading. So remember, you have to develop your own parameters. 
which is uh, so very well known for doctors of functional medicine for pregnancy. Minimal transfer of T4 uh, occurs and the effect of HCG in pregnancy. So now, uh, very quickly, you can see that as the HCG rises, the TSH actually get, comes down and there is more binding. Uh, the TBG is going, the thyroband globally starts increasing. So you should be aware that there will be a fall. You, your, your bottom, this is very important. The lower range of serum TSH is decreased in pregnancy. So you have to keep in mind that your TSH should be a lot lower. It binds to, it binds to TSH. So these are all the factors that you need to take into consideration. Now, very important, 80% uh, common Hashimoto's disease. So if that is so, you have to pay attention to the antibodies. And I think there's a lovely talk that I just uh, attended with uh, where Dr. Praveen talked about vaccination and, and anti-TPO. And these are all the factors that keep coming and you should be very clear about this, how it impacts. So ideally, if a person is, pl is planning the pregnancy, I would say, make sure you can have antibodies under control. But if not, you remember this, anti-TPO anti antibodies are associated with increased risk of miscarriage and decreased Prob probability of live birth. Risk of spontaneous miscarriage in women with thyroid autoimmunity undergoing IVF is more. There is a, there's a higher risk based on current evidence. It appears that the presence of TIA associated with an increased risk of spontaneous miscarriage. So why would you not try to control the antibodies? The presence of serum antibodies does harm to women can even lead to recurrent miscarriage. Okay, So why would you uh, ignore antibodies? I don't know, but that's what's done. During pregnancy, it's a linear equation. As the antibodies in the maternal blood goes up, it goes also in the cord blood. So you can almost say that they are one is to one. So what do we do? All this has been discussed. What we do in functional medicine, whatever may be the condition, vitamin D, probiotics, melatonin, I would put up there, selenium, zinc, curcumin, but I'm going to add something more to that. T3 monotherapy, and combination therapy, detox, and alternate immune modulation therapies. You have to do something for immune modulation. By the way, there are two conditions where I strongly push for monotherapy of T3. And some most conditions, I don't mind a combination. And these conditions, number one is when I'm treating infertility. And number two, when I'm treating clinical depression. All right. So subacute thyroiditis. Now, this I will just summarize. As already talked about, uh, Dr. Praveen spoke about it. But there is so much of evidence that... Uh, but remember, they're trying to... Whenever you see an article in my journal club, I teach my students how to read the article. Look at this article, the second one first I'm reading. It says COVID vaccination was associated with a modest increase. Now we are not asking them whether modest or they, these are the companies like to uh, like to use these adjectives. And I hate uh, scientific journalists that try to use adjectives. They have to use more specific technical terms. But modest increase in the anti-thyroid antibodies and blah blah blah. They gave the reasons. And it's however what it is saying is that the neutralizing antibody was not uh, not influenced. But look at this uh, this part. Our results provide reassurance for people to receive. I don't want a scientific journal telling me whether you want to give reassurance for people or not. That's not the business of scientific journals. But when you see these words in an article, you know that this is an inspired article by a pharma company. So remember to take this pinch of salt. But in any case, it has proved that COVID vaccination causes an increase in antithyroid antibodies. It's been proved. Even the company Pfizer itself says it. In conclusion, that patients with autoimmune thyroiditis as a uh, present similar immunological response to COVID-19 vaccine. So everything is telling you that it is so, but here's the, uh, the problem. They are trying to underplay it. It tells me that, well, don't worry, in, in six months it returns, in six months is fine. But a person who's, you're giving it in pregnancy and six months is a long time in pregnancy. Out of nine months, if six months it takes to return, what are you going to do? You've already caused the damage. So you can't take that six months very casually. A couple trying to conceive, for years, suddenly you say, sorry, boss, six months, now you have to wait because antibodies, you can't conceive, now we'll wait, we'll see what happens. So we have to understand that we have to do something and a lot can be done. And I'll end with a, with a nice, on a positive note and a, and a nice article, I've got one minute to go. Let's take this 36-year-old female, obviously female patient, which delivered actually a baby boy in 2021. Now, when this patient came, and I'm talking about a, a Sipalika, Mahesh is over here, Sipalika, five petal, and, uh, and I would say Belsante is the stigma style ovary and the stamen for this uh, program. We, we, uh, we, we, we work together. But it's amazing what results we get together. There's many success stories, but this particular story I like. They delivered after nine failed IVFs. They tried to conceive, uh, and we found that it was, uh, DHA was low, Testo was low, low BA, B12, D3, cortisol, blah, blah, blah. And we put them on BHRT and T3 and also the progesterones we optimized. It's not enough to just do one. And while we were preparing her to, you know, for uh, IVF or for some kind of conception, she, within less than three months, she conceived in September of 2020. Great. She had also, by the time, lost some weight. Uh, uh, her BMI dropped. So we knew we were on the right track clinically. 
So now the uh, question is, wow, that's nice. And, and a nine fail AVS and she conceived naturally. So again, you're still thinking, should I take T3? Should I take T4? And that comes, and this remember, this person had a, no, a positive ant, uh, antibody. Free T3, T4 was fine, but TSH was 4.5. So at least we had some, it was considered normal 4.5, but I would never consider it normal. So a holistic approach. And this is where I love the Sipalikas program. I don't have to do much. You know, I just come and take all the credit because I just put the thyroids, the T3 and the progesterone, and they do all the work with the diet, with the hormones, I mean, with the, uh, with the acupressure and everything. So while uh, I want you to remember this story, nine failed AVFs conceived naturally in September. Everybody was celebrating. The last message I got a few months ago, and I'm going to conclude with that message, says, Doctor, I'm extremely thrilled to announce the news of my second pregnancy, which through natural conception, completed 17 weeks as on 10th October 2022. Thank you very much. All right, I'll stop sharing. Uh, unfortunately, I can't hear the applause because I love this <laughs> applause. Oh, the Manish, you're there with me. There you go. <laughs> Good. There you go. It feels like we're, we're having actually our, our meeting again, Tuesday morning meetings. Good. Very right. nice, Dr. Rick. Oh, there you are. Love to hear your voice. So good. Uh, you've, you've done an amazing job with this. Uh, I, I wish I could have attended all the sessions, but it's it's super. All right. I am... Thank you. Sorry, I, I took a minute more than I should have. Karishma, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank if, you so much, sir, for putting out the knowledge on T3. Uh, there's just one question uh, that is going to interest. Uh, can you please uh, put some light on armor thyroid? Yeah. Yeah, I'll put a lot of light on armor thyroid and I'll say keep it in the dark. The reason is that armor thyroid tells you that you should use T3-T4 combination. It's nice. But my point over here is that the problem with uh, those who have said that, oh, I've used T3, I've used armor, it doesn't work. is because you've used it uh, in the wrong combination. Armor thyroid has one is to four. Most of the time, you need more of T3. You need uh, one is to two. So you, you are not flexible. Armour thyroid is fixed. But at least give credit to Armour thyroid. It's a, it's a brand name. It was available. It made the desiccated porcine or pig's thyroid. It brought it into an FDA-approved matter. So at least today, nobody can say that the concept is not FDA-approved. Everybody has a problem with FDA approval. No? So if Armour thyroid got the approval, it has done that. But if you were to use Armour thyroid, go ahead and use Armour thyroid. You want to use other forms of uh, desiccated thyroid, go ahead and use it. You want to use compounded thyroid, go ahead and use it. But finally, it is a T3 in that that's going to do the job. So it's the person that's giving the treatment. Make sure you have a doctor that understands uh, rather than just taking Armour thyroid. So Armour thyroid, uh, I, I, it has the downside of Armour thyroid is because uh, many of these will cause a raise in the autoantibodies. Uh, if you find that it's raising the antibodies, it means that you could be allergic to one of those components because it derives from, from pigs. Uh, so be uh, be careful when you use it. But uh, it's better than better than uh, T4. That means I would I would tell you that. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Mahesh, sir, for joining his uh, joining into his session. And he has not left the meeting, uh, the entire conference, day one, day two, day three, from the start till end. Uh, I know. Whenever I, whenever I message. Whenever I message him, I, I have to I have to find him in the conference and then give him a private message. He doesn't answer his phone. He doesn't talk. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, thanks to him. That, uh, yeah, thank you so much for attending the, most... the entire conference with uh, such sincerity at this uh, level. Thank you so much. Thank you.